Level 2. My avatar materialized in front of my locker on the second floor of my high school, the exact spot where I'd been, I'd been standing when I logged out the night before. I glanced up and down the hallway. My virtual surroundings looked almost, but not quite real. Everything inside the oasis was beautifully rendered in three dimensions. Unless you pull focus and stop to examine your surroundings more closely, it was easy to forget that everything you were seeing was computer generated, and that with and that was with my crappy school-issued Oasis console. I'd heard that if you accessed the, sim the simulation with a new state-of-the-art immersion rig, it was almost impossible to tell the Oasis from reality. I touched my locker door and it popped open with a soft metallic click. The inside was sparsely decorated. A picture of Princess Leia posing with her blaster pistol. A group photo with the members of Monty Python in their Holy Grail costumes. James Holiday's Time magazine cover. I reached up and tapped the, tapped the stack of my textbooks on the locker's top shelf, and they vanished, then reappeared in my avatar's item inventory. Aside from my textbooks, my avatar had only a few meager possessions, a flashlight, an iron sword, a small bronze shield, and a suit of banded leather armor. These items were all non-magical and of low quality, but they were the best I could afford. Items in the Oasis had just as much value as things in the real world, sometimes more, and you couldn't pay for them with food vouchers. The Oasis credit was the coin of the realm, and in these dark times it was also one of the world's most, most stable currencies, valued higher than the dollar, pound, euro, or yen. A small mirror was mounted inside my locker door, and I caught a glimpse of my virtual self as I closed it. I designed my avatar's face and body to look more or less like my own. My avatar was had a had a slightly smaller nose than me, and he was taller, and thinner, and more muscular, and he didn't have any teenage acne. But aside from these minor details, we looked more or less identical. The school's strictly enforced dress code required that all student avatars be human, and of the same gender and age as the student. No giant two-headed hermaphrodite demon unicorn avatars were allowed, not on school grounds anyway. You could give your Oasis avatar any name you liked, as long as it was unique, meaning you had to pick a name that hadn't already been taken by someone else. Your avatar's name was also your email address and chat ID, so you wanted it to be cool and easy to remember. Celebrities have been known to pay huge sums of money to buy an avatar name they wanted from a cyber squatter who had already reserved it. When I created my Oasis account, I named my avatar Wade the Great. After that, I kept changing it every, every few months, usually to something equally ridiculous. But my avatar had now had the same name for over five years. On the day the hunt began, I decided to become a gunter. I'd rename my avatar Parsifal, after the knight of Arthurian legend who found the Holy Grail. The other more common spellings of that knight's name, Percival, Percival, had already been taken by other users, but I preferred the name Parsifal anyway. I thought it had a nice ring to it. People rarely use their real names online. Anonymity was one of the major perks of the Oasis. Inside the simulation, no one knew who you really were unless you wanted them to. Much of the Oasis popularity and culture were built around this fact. Your real name, fingerprints, and retinal patterns were stored in the, your Oasis account, but gregarious simulation systems kept that information encrypted and confidential. Even GSS's own employees couldn't look up an avatar's true identity. Back when Holiday was still running the company, GSS had won the right to keep every Oasis user's identity private in a landmark Supreme Court ruling. When I had first enrolled in the Oasis public school system, I was required to give them my real name, avatar name, mailing address, and social security number. That information was stored in my student profile, but only my principal had access to that. None of my teachers or fellow students knew who I really was and vice versa. Students weren't allowed to use their avatar names while they were at school. This was to prevent teachers from having to say ridiculous things like pimp grease, please pay attention, or Big Wang 69, would you please stand up and give us your book report? Instead of student, instead students were required to use their real, your real first names followed by a number to differentiate them from other students with the same name. 
When I enrolled, there were already two other students at my school with the, na with the first name Wade, so I had been assigned the student ID of Wade 3. That name floated above my avatar's head whenever I was on school grounds. The school bell rang and a warning flashed on the corner of my display, informing me that I had 40 minutes until the start of first period. I began to walk my avatar down the hall, using a series of subtle hand motions to control its movements and actions. I could use voice commands to move around if my hands were otherwise occupied. I strode in the direction of my world history classroom, smiling and waving to the familiar faces I passed. I was going to miss this place when I graduated in a few months. I wasn't looking forward to leaving school. I didn't have money to attend college, not even one, not even one in the Oasis, and my grades weren't good enough for a scholarship. My only plan after graduation was to become a full-time gunter. I didn't have much choice. Winning the contest was my one chance of escaping the stacks. Unless I wanted to sign a five-year indenturement contract with some corporation, and that was about as appealing as, to me as rolling around in broken glass in my birthday suit. As I continued down the hallway, other students began to materialize in front of their lockers, ghostly apparitions that rapidly solidified. The sound of, their, of chattering teenagers began to echo up and down the corridor. Before long, I heard an insult hurled in my direction. Hey, hey, if it isn't Wade 3, I heard a voice shout. I turned and saw Todd 13, an obnoxious avatar I recognized from Algebra 2 class. He was standing with several of his friends. Great outfit, Slick, he said. Where'd you snag the sweet threads? My avatar was wearing a black t-shirt and blue jeans. One of the free default skins you could select when you created your account. Like his Cro-Magnon friends, Todd 13 wore an expensive designer skin, probably purchased in some off-world mall. Your mom bought them for me, I retorted without breaking my stride. Tell her I said thanks the next time you stop at home and breastfeed and pick up your allowance. Childish, I know, but virtual or not, this was, this was still high school, and the more childish an insult, the more effective it was. My jab incited laughter from a few of his friends and the other students standing nearby. Todd 13 scowled and his face actually turned red, a sign that he hadn't bothered to turn off his account's real-time motion feature, which made your avatar mirror your facial expressions and body language. He was about to reply, but I muted him first, so I didn't hear what he said. I just smiled and continued on my way. The ability to mute my peers was one of my favorite things about attending school online, and I took advantage of it almost daily. The best thing about it is that they could see that you'd, mute, that, that you'd muted them, and they couldn't do a damn thing about it. There was never any fighting on school grounds. The simulation simply didn't allow it. The entire planet of Ludus was a no PvP zone, meaning that no player versus player combat was permitted at this school. I'm sorry, was permitted. At this school, the only real weapons were words, so I had I'd become skilled at wielding them. I would attended school in the real world up until the sixth grade. It hadn't been a very pleasant experience. I was a painfully shy, awkward kid with low self-esteem and almost no social skills, a side effect of spending most of my childhood inside the Oasis. <clears throat> Online, I didn't have a problem talking to people or making friends. But in the real world, interacting with other people, especially kids my own age, made me a nervous wreck. I never knew how to act or what to say, and when I did work up the courage to speak, I always seemed to say the wrong thing. My appearance was part of the problem. I was overweight and had, it, and had been for as long as I could remember. My bankrupt diet of government's subsidized sugar and starch-laden food was a contributing factor, but I was also an Oasis addict. So the only exercise I usually got back then was running away from bullies before and after school. To make matters worse, my limited wardrobe consisted entirely of ill-fitting clothes from thrift stores and donation bins, the social equivalent of having a bullseye painted on my forehead. Even so, I tried my best to fit in. Year after year, my eyes would scan the lunchroom like a T-1000, searching for a clique that might accept me. But even the other outcasts wanted nothing to do with me. I was too weird even for the weirdos. And girls? Talking to girls was out of the question. To me, they were like some exotic alien species, both beautiful and terrifying. Whenever I got near one of them, I invariably broke out in a cold sweat and lost the ability to speak in complete sentences. For me, school had been a Darwinian exercise, a daily gauntlet of ridicule, abuse, and isolation. 
By the time I entered sixth grade, I was beginning to wonder if I'd been able, if I'd be able to maintain my sanity until graduation, still six long years away. Then one glorious day, our principal announced that any student with a passing grade point average could apply for transfer to the new Oasis public school system. The real public school system, the one run by the government, had been an underfunded, overcrowded train wreck for decades. And now the conditions at many schools had gotten so terrible that every kid with half a brain was being encouraged to stay home and attend school online. I nearly broke my neck sprinting to the school office to submit my application. It was accepted and I transferred to Oasis Public School, hashtag number, I'm sorry, <laughs> number 1873, the following semester. Prior to my transfer, my Oasis avatar had never left Incipio, the planet at the center of Sector 1, where new avatars were spawned at the time of their creation. There wasn't much to do on Incipio except chat with other noobs or shop in one of the giant virtual malls that covered the planet. If you wanted to go somewhere more interesting, you had to pay a teleportation fare to get there, and that cost money, something I didn't have. So my avatar was stranded on Incipio. That is until my new school my new school emailed me a teleportation voucher to cover the cost of my avatar's transport to Ludus, the planet where all the Oasis public school systems I'm sorry, where all the Oasis public schools were located. There were hundreds of school campuses on here on Ludus, spread out evenly across the planet's surface. The schools were all identical because the same construction code had been copied and pasted into a different location whenever a new school was needed. And since the buildings were just pieces of software, the design wasn't limited by monetary constraints or even by the laws of physics. So every school was a grand place of learning. With polished marble hallways, cathedral-like classrooms, zero-G gymnasiums, and virtual libraries containing every school board approved book ever written. On my first day at OPS 1873, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Now instead of running a gauntlet of bullies and drug addicts on my walk to school each morning, I went straight to my hideout and stayed there all day. Best of all, in the Oasis, no one could tell that I was fat and that I had acne or that I wore the same shabby clothes every week. Bullies didn't pelt me with spitballs or give me atomic wedgies or pummel me by the bike rack after school. No one could even touch me. And here, I was safe. When I arrived in my world history classroom, several students were already seated at their desks. Their avatars all sat motionless with their eyes closed. This was a signal that they were engaged, meaning they were currently on phone calls, browsing the web, or logged into chat rooms. It was poor Oasis etiquette to try to talk to an engaged avatar. They usually just ignored you, and you'd get an automated message telling you to piss off. I took a seat at my desk and tapped the engage icon at the edge of my display. My own avatar's eyes slid shut, but I can still see my surroundings. I tapped another icon and a large two-dimensional web browser window appeared, suspended in space directly in front of me. Windows like this one were visible to only my avatar, so no one could read over my shoulder unless I selected the option to allow it. My homepage was set to The Hatchery, one of the more popular Gunter message forums. The Hatchery's site interface was designed to look and operate like an old pre-internet dial-up bulletin board system complete with the screech of a 300 bar modem during the long the login sequence. Very cool. I spent a few minutes scanning the most recent message threads, taking in the latest Gunter news and rumors. I rarely posted anything to the boards, even though I made sure to check them every day. I didn't see much interest of this morning. I didn't see much of interest this morning. The usual Gunter clan flame wars, ongoing arguments about the correct interpretation of some cryptic passage in Anorak's almanac, High-level avatars bragging about some new magic item or artifact they'd, they'd obtained. This crap had been going on for years now. In the absence of any real progress, Gunter's subculture had become mired in bravado, bullshit, and pointless, pointless infighting. It was sad, really. My favorite message threads were those devoted to bashing the Sixers. Sixers was the derogatory nickname Gunters had given to employees of Innovative Online Industries. IOI was a global communications conglomerate and the world's largest internet service provider. A large portion of IOI's business centered around providing access to the, to the Oasis on, and, selling, and on selling goods and services inside it. For this reason, IOI had attempted several hostile takeovers of gregarious simulation systems, all of which had failed. 
Now they were trying to seize control of GSS by exploiting a loophole in Holiday's will. IOI had created a new department within the company that they call their Oology Division. Oology was originally defined as the science of studying birds' eggs, but in recent years it had taken on a second meaning, the science of searching for Holiday's Easter egg. IOI's Oology Division had but one purpose, to win Holiday's contest and seize control of his fortune, his company, and the Oasis itself. Like most Gunters, I was horrified at the thought of IOI taking control of the Oasis. The company's PR machine had made his intentions crystal clear. IOI believed that Holiday had never properly monetized his creation, and they wanted to remedy that. They would start charging a monthly fee for access to the simulation. They would plaster advertisements on every visible surface. User anonymity would, and free speech would become things of the past. The moment IOI took over, the Oasis would cease to be the open source virtual utopia I had grown up in. It would, be, it would become a corporate run dystopia, an overpriced theme park for wealthy elitists. IOI required its egg hunters, which they referred to as oologists, to use their employee numbers as their Oasis avatar's names. These numbers were all six digits in links and they all, and they all began with the numeral six, so everyone began become, everyone began calling them Sixers. These days, most Gunters refer to them as the Sucksores because they sucked. To become a Sixer, you had to sign a contract stipulating, among other things, that if you found Holiday's Egg, the prize would become the sole property of your employer. In return, IOI gave you a bi-monthly paycheck, <clears throat> food, lodging, health care benefits, and a retirement plan. The company also provided your avatar with high-end armor, vehicles, and weapons, and covered all your teleportation fares. Joining the Sixers was a lot like joining the military. Sixers weren't hard to spot because they all looked identical. They were all required to use the same hulking male avatar, regardless of the operator's true gender, with close with close cropped dark hair and facial features left at the default system settings. At the default at the system default settings. And they all wore the same navy blue uniform. The only way to tell these corporate drones apart was by checking the six digit employee number stamped on their right breast just beneath the IOI corporate logo. Like most Gunters, I loathed the Sixers and was disgusted by their very existence. By hiring an army of contract egg hunters, IOI was perverting it, the entire spirit of the contest. Of course it could be argued that all the Gunters who had joined clans were doing the same thing. There were now hundreds of Gunter clans, some with thousands of members, all working together to find the egg. Each clan was bound by an ironclad legal agreement stating that if one clan member won the contest, all members would share the prize. Solos like me didn't care much for the clans either, but we still respected them as fellow Gunters, unlike the Sixers whose goal was to hand the Oasis over to an evil multinational conglomerate intent on ruining it. Ruining it. Ruining it. <laughs> My generation had never known a world without the Oasis. To us, it was as much... It was much more than a game or an entertainment platform. It had been an integral part of our lives for as far back as we could remember. We had been born into an ugly world, and the Oasis was our one happy refuge. The thought of the simulation being privatized and homogenized by IOI horrified us in a way that those born before its introduction found difficult to understand. For us, it was like someone threatening to take away the sun or charge a fee to look up at the sky. The Sixers gave Gunters a common enemy, and Sixer bashing was a favorite pastime in our forums and chat rooms. A lot of high-level Gunters had a strict policy of killing, or trying to kill, every Sixer who crossed their path. Several websites were devoted to tracking Sixer activities and movements, and some Gunters spent more time hunting the Sixers than they did searching for the egg. The bigger clans actually held a yearly competition called 86 the Sucksores with a prize for the clan who managed to kill the largest number of them. After checking a few other Gunter forums, I tapped a bookmark icon from one of my favorite websites, Artie's Missives, the blog of a female Gunter named Arthremis, pronounced Artemis. I discovered it about three years ago and had a had been a loyal reader ever since. She posted these great rambling essays about her search for Holiday's Egg which she called a maddening MacGuffin hunt. She wrote with an endearing, intelligent voice, 
and her entries were filled with self-deprecating humor and witty, sardonic asides. In addition to her posting often hysterical interpretations of the past of passages in the almanac, she also linked to the books, movies, and TV shows and music she was currently studying as part of her holiday research. I assume that all these posts were filled with misdirection and misinformation, but they were still highly entertaining. It probably goes without saying that I had a massive cyber crush on Artemis. She occasionally posted screenshots of her raven-haired avatar, and I sometimes, always, saved them to a folder on my hard drive. Her avatar had a pretty face, but it wasn't unnaturally perfect. In the Oasis, you got used to seeing freakishly beautiful faces on everyone, but Artemis' features didn't look as though they had been selected from a beauty drop-down menu on some avatar creation template. Her face had the distinctive look of a real person's, as if her true features had been scanned and scanned in and mapped onto her avatar. Big hazel eyes, rounded cheekbones, and po a pointy chin, and a perpetual smirk. A perpetual smirk. I found her unbearably, attract unbearably attractive. Artemis' body was also somewhat unusual. In the Oasis, you usually saw one of two body shapes on female avatars. The absurdly th thin yet wildly popular supermodel frame, or the top-heavy, wasp-waisted, porn starlet physique, which looked even less natural in the Oasis than it did in the real world. But Artemis' frame was short and rubenesque, all curves. I knew the crush I had on Artemis was both silly and ill-advised. What did I really know about her? She never revealed her true identity, uh, of course. She never revealed her true identity, of course or her age or location in the real world, there was no telling what she really looked like. She could be 15 or 50. A lot of Gunters even questioned whether she was really female, but I wasn't one of them. Probably because I couldn't bear the idea of the girl with whom I was virtually smitten might actually be some middle-aged dude named Chuck with back hair and male pattern baldness. In the years since I had first started reading Artie's missives, it had, been, it had become one of the most popular blogs on the internet, now logging several million hits a day, and Artemis was now something of a celebrity, at least in Gunter circles, but fame hadn't gone to her head. Her writing was still as funny and self-deprecating as ever. Her newest blog post was titled The John Hughes Blues, and it was an in-depth treatise on her six favorite John, H John Hughes teen movies, which she divided into two separate trilogies. The Dorky Girl Fantasies Trilogy, which is 16 Candles, Pretty in Pink, and Some Kind of Wonderful, and the Dorky Boy Fantasies Trilogy, The Breakfast Club, Weird Science, and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Just as I had finished reading it, an instant message popped up, an instant message window popped up on my display. It was my best friend, H. Okay, if you want to split hairs, he was my only friend, not counting Mrs. Gilmore. H. Top of the morning, amigo. Parsifal. Hola, compadre. H. What are you up to? Parsifal. Just surfing the turf. You? H. Got the basement online. Come and hang out before school, fool. Parsifal. Sweet. I'll be there in a sec. I closed the IM window and checked the time. I still had about half an hour until class started. I grinned and tapped a small door icon at the edge of my display and then selected H's chat room for my list of favorites. Level 3. The system verified that I was on the chat room's access list and allowed me to enter. My view of the classroom shrank from the limits of my peripheral vision to a small thumbnail window in the lower right of my display, allowing me to monitor what was in front of my avatar. The rest of my field of vision was now filled with the interior of H's chat room. My avatar appeared just inside the entrance, a door at the top of the carpeted staircase. The door didn't lead anywhere. It didn't even open. This was because the basement and its contents couldn't didn't exist as part of the oasis. Chat rooms were standalone simulations, temporary virtual spaces that avatars could access from anywhere in the oasis. My avatar wasn't actually in the chat room. It only appeared that way. Wade three slash Parsifal was still sitting in my world history classroom with his eyes closed. Logging into a chat room was a little like being in two places at once. H had named his chat room The Basement. He programmed it to look like a large suburban rec room circa the late 1980s. 
Old movie and comic book posters covered the wood panel walls. A vintage RCA television stood in the center of the room, hooked up to a Betamax VCR, a laser disc player, and several vintage video game consoles. Bookshelves lined the far wall, lined with role-playing video game supplements and back issues of Dragon Magazine. Hosting a chat room this large wasn't cheap, but H could afford it. He made it. He made quite a bit of dough competing in televised PvP arena games after school and on the weekends. H was one of the highest ranked combatants in the Oasis in both the Deathmatch and Capture the Flag leagues. He was even more famous than Artemis. Over the past few years, the basement had become a highly exclusive hangout for elite gunters. H granted access only to people he deemed worthy, so being invited to hang out in the basement was a big honor, especially for a third level nobody like me. As I descended the staircase, I saw a few dozen gunters, other gunters milling around with avatars that varied wildly in appearance. There were, hunt, there were humans, cyborgs, demons, dark elves, Vulcans, and vampires. Most of them were gathered around the row of old arcade games against the wall. A few others stood by the ancient stereo, currently blasting the Wild Boys by Duran Duran, browsing through H's giant rack of vintage cassette tapes. H himself was sprawled on one of the chat room's three couches, which were arrayed in a U-shape in front of the TV. H's avatar was a tall, broad-shouldered Caucasian male with dark hair and brown eyes. I'd ask him once if he looked anything like his avatar in real life, and he jokingly replied, yes, but in real life, I'm even more handsome. As I walked over, he glanced up from the Intellivision game he was playing. His distinctive Cheshire grin stretched from ear to ear. Z, he shouted. What is up, amigo? He stretched out his right hand and gave me five if I dropped as I gave me five as I dropped him to the couch opposite him. H had started calling me Z shortly after I met him. He liked to give people single letter nicknames. H pronounced his own avatar's name just like the letter H. What up, Humper Dink? I said. This is a game this was a game we played. I always called him by some random H name like Harry, Hubert, Henry, or Hogan. I was making guesses at his real first name, which he'd once confided to me began with the letter H. I'd known H for a little over three years. He was also a student on Ludus, a senior at OPS number 1172, which was on the opposite side of the planet from my school. We met one weekend in a gamer in a public gutter chat room and hit it off immediately because we shared all the same interests, which is to say one interest, a total all-consuming obsession with Holiday and his Easter egg. A few minutes into our first conversation, I knew H was the real deal. An elite gunter with some serious mental kung fu. He had his 80s trivia down cold, and not just the canon stuff either. He was a true holiday scholar, and he'd apparently seen the same qualities in me, because he'd given me his contact card and invited me to hang out in the basement whenever I liked. He'd been my closest friend ever since. Over the years, a friendly rivalry had gradually developed between us. We did a lot of trash talking about which one of us would get his name up on the scoreboard first. We were constantly trying to geek out geek each other with our knowledge of obscure Gunter trivia. Sometimes we even conducted our research together. This usually consisted of watching cheesy 80s movies and TV shows here in his chat room. We also played a lot of video games, of course. H and I had wasted countless hours on two-player classes like Contra, Golden Axe, Heavy Barrel, Smash TV, and Akari Warriors. Aside from yours truly, H was the best all-around gamer I'd ever encountered. We were evenly matched at most games, but he could trounce me at certain titles, especially anything in the first-person shooter genre. That was his area of expertise, after all. I didn't know anything about who H was in the real world, but I got the sense his home life wasn't that great. Like me, he seemed to spend every waking moment logged into the Oasis. And even though we'd never actually met in person, he told me more than once that I was his best friend. So I assumed that he was just as isolated and lonely as I was. So what did you do after you bailed last night? He asked, tossing me the other Intellivision controller. We'd hung out here in this chat room for a few hours the previous evening watching old Japanese monster movies. Nada, I said. Went home and brushed up on a few classic coin ops. Unnecessary. Yeah, but I was in the mood. I didn't ask him what he'd done the night before, and he didn't volunteer any details. I knew he'd probably gone to Gygax or somewhere equally awesome 
to speed run through a few quests and rack up some XP's. He just didn't want to rub it in. H could afford to spend a fair amount of time off world, following up leads and searching for the copper key. But he never lorded this over me or ridiculed me for not having enough dough to teleport anywhere. And he never insulted me by offering me offering to loan me a few credits. It was uns it was an unspoken rule among Gunters. If you were a solo, you didn't want or need help from anyone. Gunters who wanted help joined a clan, and H and I both agreed that clans were for suck asses and posers. We both vowed to remain solos for life. We still occasionally had discussions about the egg, but these conversations were always guarded and we were careful to avoid talking about specifics. After I beat H at three rounds of Tron Deadly Discs, he threw down his Intellivision controller in disgust and grabbed a magazine off the floor. It was an old issue of Starlog. I recognized Rucker Howard on the cover and the Lady Hawk promotional photo. Starlog, eh? I said, nodding my approval. Yup, downloaded every single issue from the Hatchery's archive. Still working my way through them. I was just reading this great piece on Ewoks, The Battle for Endor. Made for TV, released in 1985, I recited. Star Wars trivia was one of my specialties. Total garbage, a real low point in the history of the wars. Says you, ass face. It has some great moments. No, I said, shaking my head. It doesn't. He's even worse than that first Ewok flick, Caravan of Courage. They should have called it Caravan of Suck. H rolled his eyes and went back to reading. He wasn't going to take the bait. I eyed the magazine's cover. Hey, can I have a look at that when you're done? He grinned. Why? So you can read the article on Lady Hawk? Maybe? Man, you just love that crap burger, don't you? Blow me, H. How many times have you seen that sap fest? I mean, you've made me sit through it at least twice. He was baiting me now. He knew Lady Hawk was one of my guilty ple pleasures and that I'd seen it over two dozen times. I was doing you a favor by making you watch it, noob, I said. I shoved a new cartridge into the Intellivision console and started to start up a single player of a game start up a single player game of Astro Smash. You thank me one day, wait and see. Lady Hawk is canon. Canon was the term we used to classify any movie, book, game, song, or TV show of which Holiday was known to have been a fan. Surely you must be joking, H said. No, I am not joking, and don't call me Shirley. He lowered the magazine and leaned forward. There is no way Holiday was a fan of Lady Hawk. I guarantee it. Where's your proof, dipshit? I asked. The man had taste. That's all the proof I need. Then please explain to me why he owned Lady Hawk on both VHS and Laserdisc. A list of all films in Holiday's collection at the time of his death was included in the appendices of Anorak's Almanac. We both had the list memorized. The guy was a billionaire. He owned millions of movies. Most of which probably, he probably never even watched. He had the D he had DVDs of Howard the Duck and Crawl too. That doesn't mean he liked them, asshat. And sure as hell doesn't make them canon. It's not really up for debate, Homer, I said. Lady Hawk is an 80s classic. It's fucking lame is what it is. The swords, they, the swords look like they were made out of tinfoil. And that soundtrack was epically lame. Full of synthesizers and shit. By the motherfucking Alan Parsons project. Lame or Rama. Beyond lame. Highlander 2 lame. Hey. I feigned hurling my Intellivision controller at him. Now you're just being insulting. Lady Hawk's cast alone makes the film canon. Roy Batty. Ferris Bueller. And the dude who played Professor Falcon in War Games. I searched my memory for the actor's name. John Wood. Reunited with Matthew Broderick. A real low point in both their careers, he said, laughing. He loved arguing about old movies even more than I did. The other gunters in the room, in the chat room were now starting to form a small crowd to, around us to listen in. Our arguments were often high in entertainment value. You must be stoned, I shouted. Lady Hawk was directed by Richard fucking Donner. The Goonies. Superman the movie? You saying that guy sucks? I don't care if Spielberg directed it. It's a chick flick disguised as a sword and sorcery picture. The only genre film with less balls is probably freaking legend. Anyone who actually enjoys Lady Hawk is a bona fide USDA choice pussy. Laughter from the peanut gallery. I was actually getting a little pissed off now. I was a big fan of legend too. And H knew it. Oh, so I'm a pussy. You're the one with the Ewok fetish. 
I snatched the Star Log out of his hands and threw it against the Revenge of the Jedi poster on the wall. I suppose you think your extensive knowledge of Ewok culture is going to help you find the egg? Don't start on the Endorians again, man, he said, holding up an index finger. I've warned you, I will ban your ass, I swear. I knew this was a hollow threat, so I was about to push the Ewok thing even further, maybe give him some crap for referring to them as Endorians. But just then, a new arrival materialized on the staircase, a total lamer by the name of Irock. I let out a groan. Irock and H attended the same school and had a few classes together, but I still couldn't figure out why H had granted him access to the basement. Irock fancied himself an elite gunter, but he was nothing but an obnoxious poser. poser. Sure, he did a lot of teleporting around the Oasis, competing, completing quests and leveling up his avatar, but he didn't actually know anything, and he was always brandishing an oversized plasma rifle the size of a snowmobile. Even in chat rooms, where it was totally pointless, the guy had no sense of decorum. Are you cocks arguing about Star Wars again, he said, descending the steps and walking over to join the crowd around us. That shit is so played out, yo. I turned to H. If you want to ban someone, why don't you start with this clown? I hit reset on the Intellivision and started another game. Shut your hole, Penisville, I rock reply, using his favorite mispronunciation of my avatar's name. He doesn't ban me because he knows I'm elite. Ain't that right, H? No, H said, rolling his eyes. That ain't right. You're about as elite as my great-grandmother. And she's dead. Screw you, H, and your dead grandma. Gee, I rock, I muttered. You always manage to elevate the intelligence of level of the conversation. The whole room just lights up the moment you arrive. So sorry to upset you, Captain No Credits, I rock said. Hey, shouldn't you be on Incipio panhandling for change right now? He reached for the second Intellivision controller, but I snatched it up and tossed it to H. He scowled at me. Prick? Poser? Poser? Penisville is calling me a poser? He turned to address the small crowd. This chump is so broke that he has to bum rise to Greyhawk just so he can kill kobolds for copper pieces. And he's causing, calling me a poser. This, this elicited a few snickers from the crowd, and I felt my face turn red under my visor. Once about a year ago, I'd made the mistake of hitching, an off, hitching a ride off-world with Irock to try to, get, try to gain a few experience points. After dropping me in a low-level quest area on Greyhawk, the jerk had to follow me. The jerk had followed me. I spent the next few hours slaying a small band of kobolds, waiting for them to respawn, and then slaying them again, over and over. My avatar was still only first level at the time, and it was one of the only safe ways for me to level up. Irock had taken several screenshots of my avatar that night and labeled them Penisville, the mighty Cobalt Slayer. Then he posted them to the hatchery. He still brought it up every chance he got. He was never going to let me live it down. That's right. I called you a poser, poser. I stood up and got in his grill. You're an ignorant, know-nothing twink. Just because you're 14th level doesn't make you a gunter. You actually had to possess some knowledge. Word, H said, nodding, in, nodding his agreement. We bumped fists. More snickering from the crowd, now directed at Irock. Irock glared at us a moment. Okay, let's see who the real poser is, he said. Check this out, girls. Grinning, he produced an item from his inventory and held it up. It was an old Atari 2600 game, still in the box. He purposefully covered the game's title with his hand, but I recognized the cover artwork anyway. It was a painting of a young man and a and woman in a Greek, in ancient Greek attire, both brandishing swords. Lurking behind them were a minotaur and a bearded guy with an eye patch. Know what this is, Hotshot? Irock said, challenging me. I'll give you one. I'll give you a clue. It's an Atari game released as part of a contest. It contains several puzzles, and if you solve them, you could win a prize. Sound familiar? Irock was always trying to impress us with some clue or piece of holiday lore he foolishly believed he'd been the first he'd been the first to uncover. Gunters loved to play the game of one upmanship and were constantly trying to prove they had acquired more more obscure knowledge than every, than everyone else. But Irock totally sucked at it. You're joking, right? I said. You just discovered the Swordcast you just discovered the Swordcast series? Irock deflated. You're holding Sword Quest, Earth World, I continue. The first game in the Sword Quest series, released in 1982. Woo woo! I smiled wide. Can you name the next three games in the series? 
Sword Quest Water World, Sword Quest Fire World, Sword Quest Air World, which was never released. His eyes narrowed. He was, of course, stumped. Like I said, he was a total poser. Anyone else, I said, opening up the question to the floor. The Gunters in the crowd eyed each other, but no one spoke up. Fire World, Water World, and Air World, H, H answered. Bingo, I said, <laughs> and we bumped fist again. Although Air World was never actually finished because Atari fell on hard times and canceled the contest before it was completed. Iraq, complete, Iraq quietly put the game back in his inventory. You should join up with the Suck Stores, Iraq, H said, laughing. They could really use someone with your vast stores of knowledge. <laughs> Iraq flipped in the bird. If you two fags already knew about the Sword Quest contest, how come I never once heard you mention it? Come on, Iraq, H said, shaking his head. Sword Quest Earthworld was Atari's first, was Atari's unofficial sequel to Adventure. Every gunter worth their salt knows about that contest. How much more obvious can you get? Iraq tried to save some face. Okay, if you're both such experts, who programmed all the Sword Quest games? Dan Hitchens and Todd Fry, I recited, trying to ask, try to ask me something difficult. I got one for you, H interjected. What were the prizes Atari gave out to the winner of each contest? Ah, I said, good one. Let's see. The prize for Earthworld contest was that was the talisman of penultimate truth. It was gold and encrusted with diamonds. The kid who won it melted it down to pay for college, as I recall. Yeah, yeah, Ace prodded. Quit stalling. What about the other two? I'm not stalling. The Fireworld prize was the chalice of light. And the Waterworld Prize was supposed to be the crown of life, but it was never awarded due to the cancellation of the contest. Same goes for the Airworld Prize, which was supposed to be the Philosopher's Stone. Ace grinned and gave me a double high five, then added, and if the contest hadn't been canceled, the winners of the first four rounds would have competed, competed for, the first, for the grand prize, the Sword of Ultimate Sorcery. I nodded. The prizes were all mentioned in the Sword Quest comic books that came with the games. Comic books which happened to be visible in the in the treasure room in the final scene of Anorak's invitation, by the way. The crowd burst into applause. Iraq lowered his head in shame. Since I had become a gunter, it had been obvious to me that Holiday had drawn inspiration for this contest from the Sword Quest from the Sword Quest contest. I had no idea if he'd borrowed any of the puzzles from them too, but I studied the games and their solutions thoroughly just to be safe. Fine, you win. Iraq said, but you both obviously need to get a life. And you, I said, obviously need to find a new hobby because you clearly lack the intelligence and commitment to be a gunter. No doubt, H said. Trying to try doing some research for a change, Iraq. I mean, did you ever hear of a of Wikipedia? It's free, douchebag. Iraq turned and walked over to the long boxes of comic books stacked on the other side of the room as if he just lost interest in the discussion. Whatever, he said over his shoulder. If I didn't spend so much time offline getting laid, I probably know just as much worth of shit as you two do. H ignored him and turned back to me. Who were the names of the twins who appeared in the Sword Quest comic books? Tara and Tor. Damn, Z, you are the man. Thanks, H. A message flashed on my display informing me that the three-minute warning bell had just rung in my classroom. I knew H and Iraq were seeing the same warning because our schools operated on the same schedule. Time for another day of higher learning, H said, standing up. Drag, Irock said. See you losers later. He gave me the finger, then his avatar disappeared as he logged out of the chat room. The other gunters began to log out and vanish too, until only H and I remained. Seriously, H, I said. Why do you let that moron hang out here? Because he's too fun to beat at video games. Because he's fun to beat at video games, and his ignorance gives me hope. How so? Because if most of the other gunters out there are as clueless as Iraq, and they are, Z, believe me, that means you and I that means you and I really do have a shot at winning the contest. I shrugged. I guess that's one way to look at it. Wanna hang out after wanna hang out to school again tonight? Around seven or so? I've got a few errands to run, but then I'm gonna tackle some of i I'm gonna tackle some of the stuff on my need to watch list. A spaced marathon, perhaps. Oh, hell yes, I said. Count me in. We logged out simultaneously just as the final bell began to ring. I want to thank everybody for joining me on this uh, latest episode of uh, Ready Player One. We will be continuing 
with chapter four and when we come back i hope you uh continue to enjoy the gameplay as it as it <laughs> flashes across the screen and also the story as i continue to tell it um we have a few more minutes we have about a minute left of a uh, gameplay left so if you want to enjoy that you can until next time i'm your host piscean lore and this is corpine and dragon npt and uh you guys have a great night peace out so its locks can engage.